my Wi-Fi on my phone, when I turn it into a hotspot, it shows up as FBI listening van number seven. <laughs> awesome. So sometimes at a restaurant, I'll just turn it on and, just see and just look around as people start looking out the windows. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. This is Nalia from Georgia Spying and Orthopedic and Talker, and you're listening to Help Me With HIPAA podcast. Welcome to episode 295 Whoa. of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT, and joining me is Donna Grindle. Carden. Good afternoon. Well, evening, Donna. Well, yeah. One thing that very rarely happens is you and I are actually sitting in the same room as we record this. It's really weird. <laughs> it's even more weird to record video. I know. We're doing it. So doing audio and video and staring at each other at the same time. It's creepy. <laughs> 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 I know. I want, I want to go back to Zoom so bad. I don't want to be here with you. <laughs> run, run like the wind. <laughs> so uh, anyway, in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about little things matter. Yeah. Oh. The little things matter. Uh, yeah. It's, it's always the little things that make a big difference, like, you know, making sure you don't check that box or... <laughs> or uncheck it. Yeah, or you go back and check it after you unchecked it, or those things. But that's not what we're going to be talking about. Um, But we are going to be talking about some of the things that uh, you need to be looking for and at that will make a big difference. Yes. Let's get her done. All right, we are. And before we dive into that, remind everybody that the HIPAA Boot Camp Virtual Edition in August. Yoo-hoo. Would it be the August edition? The (laughs) August edition. The The second virtual edition of 2021. The final, the final countdown. Bard do. <laughs> anyway, it comes comes up August seventeen through nineteen. If you want to get early bird pricing, then I suggest get in there now. And uh, somebody's already reminded us last week. Well, I guess it was a couple of days ago that the cart wasn't functioning properly. I was like, people already buying tickets. I love That's it. Awesome. <laughs> it's awesome to find out that somebody's trying to buy and they can't. Not really. No. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, gosh, they're buying this early. But, well, but you know, we got that brand new website that looks so cool. I know. Whoever did yeah. that did an amazing job. Yeah, I've got to find out who that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, if you're interested in the boot camp, this will be our last one for the year. Mm-hmm. So get them in and get them all trained up. Go to thehippabootcamp.com for more. Thanks to our donors. We do appreciate it. Because of you, I bought a cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Buy me a cup. Uh, yeah. So, um, so Don and I are. Would you say on location? What are we? What are we t- this weekend? We're, we're doing a planning a retreat. Planning retreat. Yeah, we're doing a planning retreat for all the irons we have in the fire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got four different projects we do across two of us, which I don't know why. It yeah. just keeps getting. I know. Just it's like rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep multiplying. <laughs> so yeah. um, we are going to dive right into today's episode. And the first thing we have up is HIPAA Say What? And because we aren't in our normal locations, I don't have the little thing to play with, which I'm sure Boyan's glad <laughs> that I don't have the little <laughs> sound pad. <laughs> I'm sure we'll hear something about it. Yeah. So HIPAA Say What? <laughs> Uh, so this was funny. Um, and then again, not. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know that I've ever heard that somebody is going to fake a HIPAA violation in order to get somebody else in trouble. Maybe it's happened before. I don't know. Not with this much of flair. Yeah. And but, of course, happened in the Savannah area. Uh, yeah. Georgia, yeah. <laughs> where all this stuff happens. <laughs> right down the river here. I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we I think we may have even mentioned the original when this hit the news originally. So, apparently, there's, you know, dude got mad. <laughs> 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 I 
and somebody else, and then went. I mean, went to a lot of trouble. Uh huh. Took like went out and made all of these email addresses that made it look like they were being sent to you know real people, and then logged in and printed those out as. But he was actually doing it. And so what he did, his name is uh, Jeffrey Parker. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what he did, what had happened? Was, he um, he took some, all, all we know is it's graphic pictures. Okay. That supposedly a nurse at the hospital had given him and had also sent to all these other people and created these fake email accounts and made it look like it happened. That's one thing. Okay, mm -hmm. first of all, that's a lot of effort to try to turn somebody in. But then, instead of just like go to the hospital and try to turn them in to get them in trouble, went to the news. <laughs> <laughs> you had to get some airtime. It's 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, and this, you know, how... You and I were just having a discussion about how other people's brains work and or, we don't get them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this, this, I don't get it. But yeah, for some reason, that was the logical path. And if he would have stayed within just the, the hospital complaint environment, yeah, no. he probably would have got away with it. Well, or at least it wouldn't have been as bad as it is now. Yeah. <laughs> right, because then he went and got on the news, which then, you know, triggers, as we've mentioned many times, that triggers many different uh, regulations and enforcement people to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And then when they said, prove it, and they go to the nurse and say, you know, show us, let's work with me on this. They can go to the nurse's email and see. Nothing was sent. Right. So not a lot of technical skills, but just enough to dig a really deep hole with all those created accounts and stuff. So it was real easy for them to go, yeah, that didn't happen. You made it up. Mm -hmm. And then he's kind of like, darn the luck. And <laughs> <laughs> When I was reading this, though, I, you know, I'm, I'm going through going, why? What? Why would he do this? Yeah. And my first thought was... He thinks there's some kind of reward. <laughs> well, now I think it was all revenge on the nurse. It was revenge. When I got to the end of the article, I find out <laughs> that the nurse was an ex lover of his. Oh, see. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that makes even more yeah. sense. Yeah, it was it was a big revenge thing. Yeah. Maybe that explains why the brain was just not functioning properly. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the bottom line is, it, it, as it mentions, it, you know, this started October 2019. And we probably would have followed it closer had it not been, you know, when it was. But the net of it is he was charged with making false statements. And what was it? The maximum five years in prison and $250,000. Yeah. I love how the court documents which do not identify the targeted healthcare worker or the hospital because they're trying to say look you know this dude did it but the uh <laughs> misdeeds you know i think it's this guy is now they just announced when was the article like february that uh, the department of justice so this literally is a federal case mm -hmm. Instead of five years and $250,000, our friend Jeff <laughs> decided he was going to plead guilty. So instead of five years in uh, prison and $250,000, which would not be fun, agreed to six months in prison and a $1,200 fine. And I think there's also like some, uh, you know, probation and all that kind of stuff that happens after the fact. You're banned from the OCR website. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he knew to go there, you know, just trying to represent himself as a, a whistleblower yeah. to the news. And I, you know, the, the thought process, I don't I, I'm just wondering, like, 
because was he trying to get the lady fired or was he trying to get her arrested? I mean, that's I, it, it doesn't yeah. say in the article, but I mean, I don't a, clearly not a well thought through plan. No, but you don't use HIPAA as a weapon. No, you know, and I think that now we could interview Jeffrey about it. I mean, my ex wife was a nurse, mm-hmm. and I had uh, many of emotion. That could have drove me to do something <laughs> crazy like that, <laughs> but I never even considered that. No, I mean that took that took some. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot there, and uh, I I don't know. Mm. But uh, the good news is the hospital was able to quickly prove it, and it was assigned to the FBI, and the FBI agent was like, "Yeah, this ain't adding up." Yeah, you know. So you know, at least they took the time to figure it out and make sure it was all done correctly. But And then we're, we're here in a few more months how OCR, while doing this investigation, also realized that they didn't have <laughs> a risk assessment in place. And <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> and this turned into something uh, else. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, he tried to, apparently, he tried to, like, use whistleblower protections. I'm a whistleblower. You can't come after me. Yeah, but it's got to be real. I know. You're... You got to be acting in the legal term, good faith. Yes. Yes. There is that. Yeah. So off you go. <laughs> <laughs> Going to go to jail. See you there. Yeah. So no. uh, I guess HIPAA says something. <laughs> you know, HIPAA does not say uh, all that. You know, that you can't just make this stuff up and then run with it because, you know, you, people yeah. really do pay attention. Well, it's it's very similar to how some people treat their HIPAA programs in their offices. They just make it up. <laughs> <laughs> we do see that. You are correct. Yeah. Yep. So, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So down to little things that matter. Yeah. So I saw this and it was one of those things that really it, it's it, it's scary if you understand just how much people don't understand about it, which is Krebs on security, which we've mentioned many times how we follow, you know, that's our cyber news, one of our many sources, Mm -hmm. published a thing that browser extensions have been found to be botnet backdoors. Mm -hmm. So before before you turn it off, we're going to explain that. (laughs) (laughs) Don't turn it off. (laughs) You know, the whole point is, that we want people to understand. And I don't think a lot of people understand how many extensions they use. No. You know, I use extensions, but I'm always messing around, you know, checking them. And I don't just like go out on the marketplace and get any extension without, you know, I got to go look at the company. I got to go look at the developer. And unfortunately, there are times that the extension, we just talked about one a few weeks ago, the extension was perfectly fine until somebody, the developer, sold it off to somebody. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the people that bought it started doing nefarious things. Mm -hmm. It can happen. So this, though, you know, in that case, I think the guy was, the those people were like stealing data or something. But this stuff is making a back door hmm. and running like a bot, meaning they can use it for other things. So this code is just getting embedded into the browsers, and a lot of folks just let you load them because you're not loading software per se. Hmm. So your software prevents people from loading things. I think we even talked about that just recently that somebody – was trying to load software, Mm -hmm. does it also prevent people from loading extensions? I know in some cases it does because I see the notifications Mm -hmm. come in. Now, does it do it on all of them? I don't know. Because that's a lot of browsers to monitor. Yeah, I guess it it depends on how the extension installs. Mm -hmm. It would be my answer without digging into it a little bit more. Yeah. But we have we have other layers of protection that looks at more of the activities of the machine. And so it would pick up something like a botnet type indicator of compromise, <laughs> <laughs> even though it might not stop them from from loading junk on their machine. Yeah, so that well, and that's exactly, you know, the article was talking about that 
what was the stat? Hang on, I got it here. Believe it or not, it says 53.21, because we must be exact on our percentage <laughs> of all Chrome extensions have not been updated in the past two years. Wow. Right. In the past 30 days, 5.21% of extensions have been updated. So there's not been a ton updated even recently mm -hmm. of the ones that have been updated. So what happens is a lot of these, you know, somebody makes these things and then, you know, they publish it and people are using it, but they don't get paid for it. You know, you get what you pay for. Yeah. You know, so I tend to use them when they're coming from the vendors of the software that I use. Right. You know, so... That is, uh, you know, a whole different ball game because you're already using their software. Generally, uh, in every case, it's somebody I'm paying to use their software. Mm -hmm. So I, I've already invested in. Please don't mess up. Yeah, you know, for for me, now I used to do a long time ago before cybersecurity was as important as it is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was doing what pre people do now, which is I'd see a, you know, extension that did something like, oh, cool. <laughs> and load it, you know, yeah. and I'd have, I mean, it wouldn't be nothing for me to have 30 or 40 extensions loaded. Well, yeah. And now they have that really cool little puzzle piece. Well, I, it's on brave, but yeah. I don't know, but the puzzle piece where you can click it mm -hmm. and you can turn them on and off and move them around. So there's some, you know, I keep them there, but I turn them on when I need them and turn them back off. Yeah. Now I've, I've got that on some of them as well, but now uh, I think I will run less than 10 now. And most of them come from either they come from Google or they come from Microsoft or they come from mm -hmm. LastPass or they, you know, these these things. Right. I mean, as I'm looking at my tray right now, I've got three. Yeah. And there's two more that are turned off. Like you, I turn them on. I got one that's a, it's a color picker. I love uh, the color picker. Yeah. And so I don't use it all the time. And, uh, and then I got another one that records my screen. And again, I don't use it all the time either. So I just turn those on and off as I need them. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do check to see how often that they've updated. And oftentimes I'll go to turn the developer mode on and try to, you know, force an update yeah. just to see. But again, these are uh, extensions that are, are used by major companies. They're right. put, they're put out by, not by, you know, whoever, Jeffrey Parker, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. that's, that always scares me. Even when I'm doing stuff like a WordPress site, it always scares me when I'm installing a plugin that the developers is a guy's name, not yeah. a company. Yeah. Uh, and, well, even a company, the way they're getting sold now, and then what's the company background and where is it from? And Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, the extensions are, yeah, they're bad so about that. So to explain what the extension is, you have your browser, mm -hmm. which, you know, I've spent years trying to make sure people understand browsers. <laughs> That's true. You know? So I had, had somebody the other day tell me that he was using – um, uh, what did he call it? It wasn't Edge. He was using Edge, but he wouldn't call it an Edge. What well, did they call it? Internet Explorer? Um, no, um, Wedge. That's what he called it. Wedge. He was using <laughs> Wedge, and I did not have the heart to correct him. <laughs> I know. Just let it go. He's like, I'm yeah. using Wedge. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Bless him. Bless him is all you can say. Yeah, I'm using Microsoft Wedge. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, that must be a new one. I've not yeah. I heard of that. But anyway. <laughs> Get you a wedgie. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's Microsoft Edge. There's Chrome, made by Google. There's also Brave, which David and I are now both. We just use Brave. Yeah. But it's got some really cool blocking features, and it alerts you some cool stuff. But. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. You, the Firefox, another big mm -hmm. one. Safari for all you Apple people that you know still want to use old stuff <laughs> still don't know it pops up and tells you safari's blazing fast right now yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, i don't use it but yeah opera that's another opera another yeah big one. that's my that's one of my spare ones yeah but yeah there's there's so many out there that and you know we're just scratching the surface there's a grateful plenty be aware if you start seeing Tor, Onion Browser, those kind of things mentioned <laughs> on computers. Ask more <laughs> questions. But um, the, those browsers are software mm -hmm. that connects us to the world. Yeah, like Netscape. Yeah. 
<laughs> hey, that worked out for them, didn't it? It did. He made some money. Netscape Navigator. I remember using it. It was so cool. I still got 4.7 on CD. Because <laughs> you're cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but each of those have now, and, and this was cool when they built the capability in that you could put tiny little programs that would run inside the browser. Mm -hmm. So think of it as, you know, skills that the browser, you could add to the browser. Yeah. So it would be new little pieces of software. And that was great. And then people really started doing some cool stuff. And then the criminals went, hey, this stuff's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. It's software inside software. Yeah. It's like little add-ons. Yeah. Which used, didn't, used to be called add-ons. Mozilla originally, or Firefox originally called it add-ons, I think. Yeah. And then Chrome came out and called, called it, it extensions. Because extensions yeah. you're extending yeah. capabilities. But it's still to a degree, it's an integration. Yeah. Which uh, always scares me. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you think about it, this code is actually running and reading the web pages. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's up to you what you do with them. How many times have you put one in and it says, you know, give this thing ability to look at your contacts, or right. give it the ability to look at your email, give it the ability. And I know some of them have to do that to do their job. Right. But man, how many times have people loaded things on their computers and allow it to look at anything it wants to look at? Well, they don't even read it. Yeah. They just say, okay, there's some stuff that I would love to use, but it asks for way too much. Yeah. You, and I'm you, just like, I can't. I can't let you, you do that. You have to look at it and go, why do you need access to that? Exactly. Like, you know, if it's a Google one, Google's already got access. You know, yeah. you know if it's something, <laughs> you, know, the, you know, I use, you know, Trello for project management and go. So those, they're all, I already have to give them a certain amount of access. Mm -hmm. But these little bitty extensions, that, that, mm -mm. Yeah, you know. that reminds me of a, a guy the other day. He was, um, he was cutting up with me and he said, no, I don't use backups because the NSA already has a backup of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I just called them up for my, my disaster recovery is the NSA. Yeah. I know you have a copy of all my stuff already. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I've told you, be careful. We're, we are literally in Augusta, Georgia, right down the street from a big cybersecurity installation. I know. I keep waving out the window. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I told David we're putting up all of our gear here. Somebody's going to notice us, and it probably didn't help the fact that my Wi-Fi access point, which is sitting in the window currently, <laughs> <laughs> did you notice the name of it when you when you checked? No, <laughs> I didn't look. It's I just connected to mine. What are you? So my wi and my my Wi-Fi on my phone when I turn it into a hotspot, it shows up as FBI listening van number seven. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So sometimes at a restaurant, I'll just turn it on and, just and just happens. look around as people start <laughs> looking out the windows. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then there's David. There is me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about people connecting to my Wi-Fi though, <laughs> or trying to. <laughs> okay, so back in. Let's bring it back around. All right, all right, all right. We're back to the extensions and the botnets. Well, they're little things. Mm -hmm. Little things matter. Yeah. Get it? Yeah. Little things. Little thing. Extensions, very little. Now, if you do not have policies and procedures and you do not know if anybody's paying attention to the browsers that are being loaded, might want to start checking on that. Yeah. Might want to find out if IT can monitor it. Might want to, you know, make some rules. Mm hmm Create policies. Yeah. Like IT policies, like to not allow something to happen type policy. Well, yeah. You know what? There are a lot of people that you're not allowed to load software, right? Mm -hmm. And then you even have the tool where it's like you can't load software. <laughs> yeah. And clients but, complain about it all the time. <laughs> I know. But it, it <laughs> saves them many, many times. Oh, yeah. And But these get around some of that. Mm -hmm. Not always. Yeah. I think, you know, it just depends. Well, I know for us the one of the one of the software programs we use to block that what it does is uh, typically if a non if, if a standard user tries to install something it asks for administrative uh, privileges it pops up, you know, click click yes and then put in your 
administrator password. And so that's what this software looks for. It looks for that, that user prompt. access control prompt. Well, extensions don't do that. Mm -mm. They don't go through that process. Nope. Because the browser is controlling everything to do with it. Mm -hmm. So it's actually activity running within the software. Think of it as I'm going to turn on new settings and I'm going to do all this. You're not installing software on the computer. You're installing software inside the browser. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to understand these are, yes, very little things, but they can become very big problems. Oh, yeah. yeah so if they are opening a back door. Mm-hmm. Because I can, like, for example, let's say you have a policy that says nobody will set up any type of remote access to your machine. So that means you're blocking LogMeIn and TeamViewer and remote desktop protocol, potentially. You know, you're blocking all this stuff. Well, guess what? There's an extension for that. Yeah, there is. And so you could have somebody running that extension and then get remote access to your office. And never have even installed a program in the traditional sense. Yeah. And, you know, that a lot of that gets to the what we call shadow IT. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, they won't let me do this from home. Well, I've got to get it done on my work computer. So I'm going to set it up so I can't. Yep. You know. IT blocked me from doing it, but I know a way around it. it I, know, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so while... You know, you're going to have folks that are like, they're no big deal because it's so easy to turn them on. It's so easy. And they just blow right through the questions on authorizing it to do stuff. And, you know, you'll go to some websites and it'll even say, you know, download our little, you know, gizmo and it'll make things so much easier. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. For a lot of people. <laughs> and it may be making things easier for the wrong people. The more convenient it is, the less likely it's secure. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. security is not convenient. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> it is awesome. So those are, they're harder to manage. And a lot of it has to go back to training. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and depending on the size of the organization, you can distribute copies of like Chrome. You know, one of the features in Google Workspace is I can control and say, this is the Chrome and I can control what Chrome is allowed to do. But you've got to have that version and use those settings mm -hmm. and manage those settings. And if you're not doing them, it's, it's really not helpful. Or if somebody is doing them, but nobody's looking at them, Oh, yeah, well, we managed that. But did you put any limitations on it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is anybody looking? Yeah. So these are things that you have that conversation with IT. You start asking and looking. It's real easy to tell. I mean, just a few clicks. People that aren't like us that turn them on and off and all those kind of things, you just see them across there. Yeah, most times. But it, it definitely is a conversation to have with IT. It's certainly probably... Pro well, not certainly, probably not something IT is handling for you by default. Yeah. This typically is going to fall outside of what IT is actively doing. Again, you're making the assumption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, a got a I got a great one about assumptions of what IT is doing. A new one. Oh. Uh, yes. So uh, talking to. Tell me more. Talking to somebody the other day and they said, we have this server, old server in a closet over here. What's on it? And what, what specs does it have? And my response, well, it actually wasn't me, but I'll just say it was me. My okay. response was, I don't know what's on that server because it's been in the closet before I became your IT vendor. And I was told, don't worry about it. It's old equipment. We just have it stuck in the closet. It's not connected to anything. It's completely disconnected. Uh -huh. And he said, so... I thought you were maintaining all the assets of everything and you knew what everything was. And I'm like, I don't maintain what's in your closet. that's <laughs> disconnected, <laughs> not yeah. under my management or control. I have no idea what you got yeah. stuffed away somewhere, but the client had the, the misunderstanding that because we were managing all the IT assets that we were managing all the IT assets. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I'm like, yeah. oh, we're only managing the things that we have our software on and that we agreed on in this contract. 
And it didn't say anything about the closet. Yeah, it didn't say nothing about all the stuff that you got turned off, stashed away in a closet somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that that it is not that type of asset management. Um, and, and again, yeah. we we talk about this in a boot camp where oftentimes there people are using the exact same terminology to mean two different things. Mm-hmm. And and for us, when I say asset management, I mean we're managing the assets that we're managing. Yeah. Not we're managing every single possible thing that you've got stuffed everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't know about it and it's on this list, it ain't ours. Yeah, not even connected. Like a yeah. scan wouldn't catch it. It's completely disconnected. It's just an old piece of junk sitting in a closet, and they want to know why we didn't know. <laughs> why do you not know about our trash that we're keeping? Exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, it's you know, not it's, that's not a huge conversation to have. It just goes to show, again how people are disconnected from what they think it is doing and what it is actually doing. Mm -hmm. And we, no matter how hard we try and we try hard, we still run into that disconnect. And this is another example of one of those little bitty things that can cause big trouble. And everybody thinks somebody else knows that somebody else is supposed to be doing it. Mm -hmm. So yes, a big thing that one cannot assume is that the little things are always being handled. Yep. Speaking of that, in other news, <laughs> about things that are often small things that are technically big things that are often <laughs> overlooked. Small things are technically big things. Yeah. You know, it, it, they do matter because uh, Hacker News, another little area, they report exports exports yeah. <laughs> yeah the exports are warning us <laughs> <laughs> experts warn of notable increase in quickbooks data file theft attacks mm-hmm. i can't tell you the number of times that when we're doing an assessment and we will ask you know what are your critical applications that you know you're you're you have on your list for your business continuity. We're doing an assessment. That's we're going to ask those questions. Mm-hmm. And you know, they're like, uh, this is our EHR. Okay. Well, how do you, how do you get paid? Oh, well, we have our practice management. Okay. How do you pay your bills? Oh, well we have QuickBooks, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's thinking that through and realizing if you have accounting software, and QuickBooks is just a really common one, but there's plenty of others. People still are using the the desktop applications. Mm-hmm. Many, many people have moved online, but a vast majority of particularly larger size organizations are utilizing the desktop clients, right? which may even have like the server version with the data files on a server where multiple people can access them. Great. Who's worried about those? Mm-hmm. Who's worried about making sure those are backed up? Who's mo- worried about making sure they're secured? And apparently, the more you ask, the less you hear <laughs> about that. And, you know, there's times where I've been in organizations where, you know, I'm worried about the PHI because that's what my job was. But everybody's like, well, when are you going to help us tell us, when do you think they'll be able to get the QuickBooks programs up? <laughs> Don't, that's that's not on my list. Yeah, I, I, I'm. You haven't, you haven't, you don't have a plan. No. Yeah. So, one small thing becomes a big problem because I can't pay people. Mm-hmm. You know, people people pretty much want to get paid. Yeah, usually. Yeah. And uh, you know, I ha- I used to write payroll software and accounts payable software, and it, before I did healthcare. And, you know, great stories from those where, you know, the software's down and and, and Ashley got a call at like 5 o'clock on a Friday of, okay, it was payday for the entire maintenance team. Uh, I can't make it right. Print their checks. They're all in the lobby. They're not <laughs> happy. I'm by myself. Help me. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it seems like such a little thing, but it can be big pretty fast in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Well, now these attacks, they're like spear phishing, 
how hard is it to figure out who's the money person in any company? Yeah. Pretty easy. Well, the other thing too, you know, we always talk about with PHI protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Think about the integrity of financial information. Yeah. I mean, you know, I could, I could end up having to pay a bunch of money in taxes because my financial information is incorrect or yeah. I don't pay enough or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of problems. Or have all your money stolen. Yeah. Or that too. Which is, you know, some of what's happening in here. Because mm -hmm. the story, you know, it takes you through. Basically, they use these phishing tools to either trick people into giving them access to the QuickBooks file or trick them into loading malware that lets them then get to the QuickBooks file. And they're using tools that it doesn't even matter if you're an administrator. You, you don't have to be an administrator. They can s just pull all that data and exfiltrate it. Yeah. Well, I've seen, gosh, <laughs> I've seen people that have their QuickBooks files on a server or a shared drive somewhere that mm -hmm. everybody in the organization can get to. Right. And they just go, yeah, but I, I've got a username and password on my QuickBooks file, <laughs> which tends to be very crappy password. Yeah. But they have that. Or they'll, or they think, well, nobody else around here has QuickBooks but me, so they can't do anything with it anyway. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh they can't download QuickBooks. <laughs> <laughs> they can't load it themselves. I know it's it's amazing. Yeah. How, how how many times I've seen people have access to QuickBooks files? So you let's say you've got Johnny down the hall who has allowed somebody, you know, Microsoft has logged into his computer to help him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. The Love quote, that one. The quote unquote Microsoft. Yeah. And, and you know, sure, they're going to look around on his computer, but they're probably going to also look around on the, on the network because how long is it going to take before he finally tells somebody that he, that he let somebody in? Or they're going to leave things there. Yeah. To come back later. Mm hmm. You know, that's the one that you really have to worry about. They leave things there to come back later. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, there's the whole like you're breaking in a building. Like if I'm going to break into a building, I, all I have to do is find a door or a window that I can prop open mm -hmm. so I can come back later. Yeah. You know, I don't have to go in immediately. I just want to get myself in there in a way that to make sure I can come back later. And, you know, maybe I walk in and, and I see the windows are locked and somehow I'm on the inside and I can just walk by and just quickly just unlock the window and keep going. Mm -hmm. Then come back later and open that window up and slide on in. Yeah. <laughs> There are so many things that, you know, even the physical safeguards people don't really, you know, again, that's probably something that you should do, but you'd probably get arrested a lot. But uh, <laughs> it'll be a window cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> but what they, they are actually saying, just like you said, that, that they would put the thing, they're finding the data is on the server. Mm hmm. But it's assigned to the everyone group. Oh, gosh. So not not just, you know, the people in accounting that need it, but everyone. Well, you know why? Because I can trust my people. Yes. How many times have you heard that? <laughs> but, you know, your, your people are very nice, and they fall for the bad guy's tricks then. And you can't, you know, yes, it could be an insider problem, but really what you're worried about first. Mm-hmm. We do talk about insiders a lot, but, you know, it's a 50-50 chance. There's this actual malicious thing. People make mistakes, and they fall for the trick. Or what about the fact that your Wi-Fi <laughs> that I can access from the parking lot of your building <laughs> <laughs> also gets me to your everyone folder? <laughs> exactly. So having that there, and apparently they take the data and they are selling the data on the dark web mm. because who wouldn't want to know your list of vendors? You know, we've talked about that many, many times. I'm going to be able to get in by telling somebody I'm trying to pay an invoice or I need information about an invoice or I need you to pay an invoice. Mm -hmm. And then they open that invoice or it's payroll or whatever. That's that's what they're doing. and. So <laughs> besides selling it, they found instances where operators behind the attacks resorted to bait and switch tactics to lure customers into making fraudulent bank transactions by posing as suppliers or partners because they got the data out of the file. 
so they knew who to call and say who they were. Mm. And all the details. Yeah. So, again, um, <laughs> advising users to remain vigilant of these attacks, ThreatLocker recommends that file permissions are not set to the everyone group. <laughs> That's very pleasant. <laughs> But, you know, checking those permissions, yes, what happens is a lot of people set those up themselves and they can't get it to work secured, so they just make it work easy. Mm -hmm. Or something's being changed, so we turn everything off, and then we don't turn it back on after, you know, everything's installed. You don't worry about the security on the back end, which is why we use checklists and stuff. Yeah, but I've seen a lot of IT people do that, too. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily super professional IT. It's more like, but my son is a whiz or, well, yeah, or mean, you know, whatever you, you list, list the relative. I mean, really, mm -hmm. but they, yeah, they can get it working, but that's not what we're worried about. We're not worried about yeah. just the thing working. We're worried about the security and privacy issues. Yeah. And we don't live in a world of, I know how to make the computers talk to each other. anymore. No, they become irrelevant. And the more that we keep seeing, I mean, there's news today that we haven't even had a chance to read because we were both running around crazy that apparently uh, Ryuk, Ryuk, whatever, mm -hmm. is now back, even though they were going to be gone. <laughs> they they rebranded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They rebranded. But now it has worm-like features. Oh. Yeah which then lets it kind of attach to things that it sees moving on your network and may be able to connect to all the things that connect to you, like your business partners. So it's more like a leech than a worm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, worms just dig holes. <laughs> they create the hole yep. to allow other things through. So, yeah, it, it's not the time to... Uh, make any assumptions and let little things go by Yeah, is what the whole point of today's episode is. Yep. You should, number one, you should have either professional IT or an IT staff, whichever, mm -hmm. depending on the size of your organization. And number two, you should have them involved in conversations fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and ask questions. We spent a lot of time at the boot camp talking about these are the questions that you should be asking IT. Mm-hmm. And we don't do that to say, here's a checklist of things to ask. We do that to say, think about things. Think think through everything that you've got going on. When you go to introduce a piece of software or a piece of hardware, or what, and don't assume anything. And if if you're dealing with somebody who makes you feel stupid because you're asking questions, then Get somebody find else. Yeah, exactly. Find somebody else because they shouldn't care. Matter of fact, they should enjoy the fact that you're asking questions. Mm-hmm. And if they try to talk over your head, get somebody else. Get somebody else. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, the only times I've ever seen IT, for me, the only time I've seen them push back when questions are being asked is because they're not doing what they tell people they're doing. Yeah. Now, you know, sometimes we have a tendency, there are times where people ask me questions and I answer it, and I think it makes absolute sense. <laughs> Because it does in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so you might, you, you know, you, you've got to work with your vendors and get on the same page. And we've talked about this a million times. But again, those are some of those little things that make a huge difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So get on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you talk about we talk about it at the boot camp, it's we're talking about it not only with like people who hire IT, but the actual IT providers themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, we, we are, one of the things we're here today is to try to figure out how to do a better job to help IT providers understand this environment and what to do. Yep. We are the, we're the bridge of the gap between IT and clinical. Business operations. Healthcare operations. That's what operations. I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm There's people that you. should be in the clinic. <laughs> in a clinic. Clinically yeah. insane. Well, <laughs> say no more. <laughs> All right. That's our show for today, folks. Thanks for listening and joining us as we're here live in person. Kind of. <laughs> Just not for you. <laughs> Remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site if you still have one. Remember for Donna and myself, 
HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.